Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Book Club. I know I say this every time, but I actually don't think I've ever been this excited for a book club. Martyr is one of the most anticipated releases this year. It's so obvious why. It's a story about art, theology, mythology, with humor and a profound sensitivity woven throughout. I know without a doubt in my heart that this book is going to be so, so, so massive and deservedly so. Kave Akbar is an Iranian American poet, currently teaching at the University of Iowa MFA program. While he has multiple poetry books published, this is his first novel, which is mind-blowing. The novel primarily follows Cyrus, a newly sober queer poet who is the orphaned son of Iranian immigrants. Cyrus becomes obsessed with martyrs and the idea of making your life and death mean something. I want to read a few reviews that I pulled that stood out to me, and then I will bring on Kave. This is a review from the New York Times. In Cyrus, Akbar has created an indelible protagonist, haunted, searching, utterly magnetic, but it speaks to Akbar's storytelling gifts that martyr is both a riveting character study and piercing family saga. What Akbar pulls off in Martyr is nothing short of miraculous. And here is a quote from Tommy Orange, author of There There, another great book. An absolute jewel of a novel, a diamond. Kava's writing is so thoroughly powerful and gorgeous you can feel it from where dreams come. This book does everything. Kava Akbar is one of my favorite writers ever. This quote I just pulled from Goodreads from an early fan because I just thought it was so hilarious and poetic. I didn't want to cry, so I held back, but holding back just gave me a headache and I ended up crying anyway. <laughs> so without further ado, let's bring on Kavit. <laughs> How are you on this bright and beautiful afternoon? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. I'm at uh, beautiful, sexy, sunny Chicago O'Hare's United Sky Lounge. I nerded out so much over your book that I went on your Instagram after this is even before we knew we'd be having this conversation. Yeah. And I saw that you announced that if you pre-ordered the book from your local indie bookstore, you would be signing the copies. And that's I true. ordered like five copies. Oh, no way. That's awesome. So, mostly for myself. I had to stop myself from immediately going back and re reading it like right after finishing it i mourned it before it was even over but i've had sufficient time with it now i cannot believe this is your first novel well it's immeasurably gratifying to hear writing in the way that you do um sure. there's this moment before you release it into the world and you know it isn't going to belong to you anymore what is yeah. that experience like for you it's deeply uncanny it exists as this one thing in your head and it's almost idiogrammatic where you just see it at a glance and it summons all of the spiritual experiential psychic emotional data that you put into the project right and then suddenly you put it in the world and it becomes a machine made out of words again right for the movie it becomes a series of interactions and a, a series yeah. of shots right you know when i look at this it's like kind of irreducible to me in a certain way i've spent so much time in it and i've had wow. my nose pressed up to the mural of it for so long that it kind of has stopped being chapters and words right i heard someone compare it once to like having a child where yeah. it's made up of you and then all of a sudden you let it into the world and people start forming their own relationships to yeah. it and their own opinions of it and it sort of no longer belongs to you anymore but you still feel this very sensitive connection to the thing and it starts changing too you know like your yeah. child at two years is a lot different than your child was when it first came out right and yes. the, the same way with the book right when I look at this cover it lights up my brain in one way but I'm sure after two years if you put me under an MRI my brain map would be totally different in an interview for the Paris Review you said everything that enters my consciousness enters first through the prism of its poetic utility how did your writing style as a poet inform your writing with this novel. Since I was like 14, 15, I've been calling myself a poet. And I assumed that that meant like living in tuberculine squalor and flipping burgers by day and then like writing poems in an attic yes. by night. If, if that's what it took to be a poet, that's what I would do, right? So I've trained myself my whole life. As I'm walking around, there's a pigeon that has like a little bit of hair tied around its legs. So I'm like, ooh, like, let me take note of that. And when I'm having an argument with my spouse and they misspeak, I'm like, ooh, that was kind of an interesting thing that they just said, you know, and like, I'll, I'll like hover above the actual interaction that I'm having and just notice the interesting moment. When I was writing this 
novel in an effort to teach myself narrative, I started watching a movie a day, watching what actors do with their hands while they're talking so that I could be like, and this is what Cyrus did with his hands. What's on the walls when people are sitting in rooms talking to each other? What are the extras doing in the scene? You know, because when I just sit down in front of a blank page, it's like suddenly I've never seen a human being before. But if I'm actively taking notes and being like, this is what Kaya did with her hands while this other yeah. actor was talking. Suddenly now there's something for my characters to do with their hands. You see what I'm saying? When we embark on this journey to create human experience as human beings, we suddenly forget everything that makes us humans. Like the closer you try to get to the human experience, the farther you maybe feel from human. That's fascinating. So you're saying like you kind of stand back to observe the human and then yeah. it's not like you're actually engaged. It's um, it's vertiginous. You get dizzy when you look at it too closely. How did you get into writing and poetry? Like you say, you always wanted to be a poet, but I don't think there are a lot of like 14 year old kids who feel like that is attainable. Can you point to key moments in your life that influence this path? And do you remember it being a path that felt celebrated or something that you almost dreaded knowing like this was my fate? I definitely didn't dread it. As soon as I realized that it was a thing that one could do, that there were people who were alive who like fed their cats off of money that they made being a poet, I was like, <laughs> that's all there is for me. I was almost angry at everyone for not telling me, but like I was so obviously a poet. What, what were you doing wasting my time teaching me chemistry? Mm -hmm. It was just like that sense of purpose. You know, I had a seminal high school English teacher, like I think a lot of writers had. He read some poems one day in class. One of them was by this poet named Yusuf Komanyaka. It was called Facing It. I asked if I could borrow the book and he let me take it home that day. And I was like, this is it. I was not particularly attached to being in this world any other way, but I knew that if being someone who just made these little machines out of words was an option, that was like a thing that someone could do, then that's what I would do. I knew it from the jump. That lives so much in your writing, in your poetry, and in your novel. When talking about a novelist friend in the book, Orchida says, one time I asked her about whether she plots out her books in advance and just fills in the details, or if she moves through the story as she writes it. She looked at me and without skipping a second, she answered like an oracle, behind me is silence and ahead of me is silence. Do you feel that is also true for you in your process of writing? Yeah, I do. I do. I love how... Um perceptive these questions are it's beautiful <laughs> this whole novel had I not spent a half decade just in my pajamas being enveloped in cats it would have never existed right like I had to be sat there otherwise all of those notebooks would have been empty and and that's that's silence right the things that I'm interested in making art about which is to say life death meaning um purpose which is all anyone has ever made art about really for the past several millennia, can't be captured concisely in language. When I say, I love you to my dog, I mean something totally different than when I say, I love you to my spouse. And when I say, I love you to my spouse, I mean something totally different than when I say, you know, I love pomegranates. These words are so nebulous and miasmic and the insufficiency of language kind of becomes the point. Like I wrote this novel and it feels in many ways like I just threw a bunch of flour on the ghost of the thing that I was actually trying to write about. And you can kind of see the shape of the thing yeah. uh, illuminated by all the language that I threw on it. The theme that you explore in Martyr is the insufficiency of language and the limitations of the medium of writing and the sort of ineffability of our experiences. You have a quote from a Jean Valentine poem, which is one of my favorite poems. Um, I can't Hey, that makes me so happy. I love her so much. And I saw that you said it's like one of your Desert Island poems. Yes. Oh, um, that makes me so happy. In the book, the quote that you use is, I came to you, Lord, because of the fucking reticence of this world, which in the poem she follows, no, not the world. No, not, not the reticence. reticence. That's such a beautiful depiction of the shortcomings yeah. sometimes of language. And in one of your poems, you say there is room in the language for being without language. Do you find these limitations and insufficiencies to be more present in one form of writing versus the other? Or do you just think like that is sort of the reality of the mediums that we choose to express ourselves? You're like doing more research than just about anyone I've taught. That's extraordinary. Yeah, I I mean, I, first of all, Jean Valentine is one of my Desert Island poets, for sure. It, when we speak about using silence as the material and mm -hmm. language as just the sort of negative space poured around it, negative space as the sort of medium, right? I call myself a language artist, which I know is really pretentious sounding and maybe kind of obnoxious, but it just feels accurate in the way of like a dancer thinking of their body as their material or space mm -hmm. as their material or a photographer thinking of light as their material, a sculptor thinking of marble or bronze 
bronze or whatever as their material. Language is the material of my art. And sometimes I write poems and sometimes I write novels and, you know, I've written in other forms too. If I took a photograph of a tree and then asked you to draw it based on that photograph, you could probably draw a pretty similar looking tree, right? But if I gave you like a description of that tree, if I was like, the tree is about 10 feet tall and the first branch comes out to the left and it's an ash tree. And I told you all that, it still wouldn't come out looking like that specific tree. Yes, Even if I yes. gave you 10,000 words, you see what I'm saying? Photography is really good at saying, this is what life is. Right. Whereas language can only really say this is what life's like, but it is that yeah. insufficiency that really delights me as an artist. There's this um, lecture that Ann Carson gave um, at Teachers and Writers in New York, and she sort of talked about the concept of leaving a space empty so that God could rush in. Is this yeah. a concept that you feel fastened to in your writing process, or do you believe that when you write from the heart or just write in general, that space is just created authentically. Totally. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah, I think a lot about how the visual space of the page mm -hmm. works on the reader. One of my former students, current friends, is a poet and an essayist named John Lee Clark. He's both deaf and blind. I remember him talking to me about how, like, when I hold a poem in my hands. You know, if it's like a little three line haiku, I know that I'm in for a very temporally brief experience. I know yeah. that it's gonna be like lickety split. I know yes. that it's gonna be really fast, right? Whereas if I'm holding like the Iliad or the Bhagavad Gita or something like this in my hand, I know that it's going to be a really long experience. So it's going to take me a few days or whatever. But for him, because everything comes on his Braille reader, which is just two lines of text, a haiku and the Bhagavad Gita read to him the same way. There's no visual data communicating to him the duration of the experience. That blew my fucking mind when I started talking to him the first time about it because I had never considered the way I was like taking in all this knowledge about the text before I even engaged the language of it. If you think of this on a spectrum, a painting, it all comes into the eye at once, right? You can focus on a detail and you can move your eye around here and there, but it's all coming into the eye at once. Whereas a sculpture, a piece of statuary, right? Like you can see most of it, but you have to walk around it to see the entirety. And then at the far end of that spectrum, it's like film uh, because it's like a still frame doesn't tell you anything about the duration. You know, it could be a 37 hour long movie or it could yeah. be a one second. And so figuring out where writing is and using the visual cavities of the page, I'm really intentional about where I place the poems, for instance, both narratively and in thinking about like giving the reader a, a beat of silence, right? A beat of visual silence mm -hmm. or letting the field of the page overwhelm in the same way that you know, if you're making someone a mixtape, you don't want every song to be like future going a thousand yeah. beats per minute. You know what I mean? Like you, yes. it goes up and down and up and down, right? As more and more people gain access to this book, you'll see where they insert themselves. The beautiful, weird thing about writing is that like the more specific and singular and, and granular you get about your own unprecedented experience. You know, like I was born in Iran. I came to America when I was two and a half. My first language was Farsi. And now I'm like a queerish, Muslimish. Midwesternish, poetish. I occupy all of these weird identity <laughs> marker Venn diagrams to the point that, like, if the only people who read this book and could respond to it were people who occupied those same circles, it would be an audience of one. It would just be me, right? But, you know, like, you read it and felt something yeah. in it, right? It's like the more granular and specific you get, the more universal it becomes somehow. It's so true. I find I relate the most to like the, the more specific, almost extreme versions of humanity versus when you see something that's a bit more palatable, it's very hard to like harness that connection to them. Taking this to the zenith would be like a guy on screen being like, I'm sad. I mean, I've been sad, you know, yeah. what I mean? but I don't really relate. You've been very open in past work um, about your struggles with addiction and your journey with sobriety. Cyrus is an addict and alcoholic as well as a poet. What was it like building a character who faces such familiar struggles? There are definitely autobiographical streaks in Cyrus, for sure. But there are also autobiographical streaks in Orchide and in Z and in yeah. Arash and in Ali. The instrument of language, now I sound really pretentious, the instrument of language. I'm going to get struck by a lightning bolt by like the writer czars in the sky. But yeah, I mean, I, I am yoked to my own unprecedented experience, right? Which means that anytime I'm writing, it's indelibly inflected by, you know, every conversation that I've ever had and every language that I've ever spoken or heard and every movie that I've ever seen and book that I've ever read and all of my genealogies and geographies. And so it all comes through. I do the unsexy, quiet, private work in recovery communities and stuff. I feel well enough to be able to speak about this stuff sort of publicly and yeah. I'm able to sort of work through some of these thoughts 
in public, right? There wouldn't be any of this without the other half of the iceberg, the stuff that no one ever sees. There's so much empathy that you have for all of your characters. People that I love struggle with addiction that has given me this like deep empathy. Do you find it more difficult to grant this empathy to the characters that you feel more closely resemble you? Or is that like a gift that you give all of your characters? That's a gorgeous question. Like the closer they are to me, you know, because it, it approaches self-love. It's easy for me to love the newcomer who's calling me and fucking up and just can't get their head on right, you know, because I'm like, oh, you're so sick. But with myself, I'm like, God, you were such a scumbag or, oh, you were such a jerk or you're so cruel or negligent of other people's interiority, right? I think of it as a book without a villain. I don't think that there's like a bad guy. I think that part of the process of writing this and my poetry is learning mm -hmm. to love the people that I've been. I remember a long time ago talking to to an elder in recovery, I was referring to, you know, back in my using days, right? And I was like, yeah, during my scumbag years. And she was like, I don't like when you talk about my friend that way. I'm grateful to you for sharing what you shared with me about your own family experience with this. You know, it's sick people. And instead of it just like making you have a runny nose or whatever, it makes you be a dick to the people who love you. That's the <laughs> symptom of this disease. And that can be pretty caustic. And there are very few people whose lives haven't been touched by it firsthand or secondhand and a family member or whatever, you know, a beloved, a friend. I hope that encountering work like this might mm -hmm. offer a kind of periscope into the perspective of the mind of the person so that people will recognize that it's not like, oh, they're just bad. They're mind is out to get them, you know, yeah. the same organ that controls their breathing and their heartbeat and the contractions of their intestinal muscles also wants to kill them. They're trying really hard to not let it. I'm so grateful anytime I come across anything that talks openly about addiction because I do think that it is something that isn't talked about that much. Mm -hmm. Everyone's experience feels like no one has ever been through this before. Mm -hmm. To read something that is from the perspective of the person going through it that is so honest can demystify all these stories that we tell ourselves and the way that we can vilify the people around us to kind of make sense of what's yeah. going on. That's incredibly gratifying to hear. If it does a hundredth of that for anyone, then it's a rousing success, sincerely. There's a passage in Martyr where Cyrus is talking to Orchida about this idea of double consciousness how a lot of marginalized people, particularly in America, are always having to see themselves through the eyes of the people who hate them, mm -hmm. and how that applies to being an Iranian self-described vaguely Muslim man in a country that hates those things. Can yeah. you share a bit on how that lens has impacted your exploration of martyrdom? It's a scary thing to be a guy who looks like this. I mean, I'm sitting in an airport right now mm. talking to you about a book that I wrote called Martyr. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not joking. I just texted a group chat about this. But like, as I was walking up here to this little sky lounge area, there was like this German guy. I, I was wearing my, you know, COVID mask because I travel a lot. And he was like, you look dangerous. And I was like, <laughs> excuse me? And he was like laughing like I was in on the joke. But I'm also so cognizant of the fact that if I put that narrative in a book, the reader will read it and be like, well, I've never walked up to an Iranian man in an airport and said, you look dangerous. And so I'm one of the good ones, right? That's what badness looks like. Right. And I've never done that. And so I'm not bad. So I avoid the easiness of stuff like that, right? That yeah. sort of ethical obviousness feels anathema to like the actual sort of spiritual growth that we're all seeking. I'm much more interested in saying, I'm fucked and so are you. What do we do about it? Versus saying right. like, here are the good ones and here are the bad ones, right? right? We're past the point of like good ones and bad ones, right? I think that we're all in some way completely it coming to terms with that and accepting that and then moving from that place as opposed to like endlessly litigating who's the good one and who's the bad one. Orchida then asked the question, why are you worried about what people who hate you think about your <laughs> art? To yeah. which Cyrus replies, well, because the people who hate me also own all the guns and all the prisons. You cannot be reading that and go, oh, well, no, no that's not me and I'm not, you know, yeah. I think so um, brave and also very real to put something like that that's so in your face in yeah. your work. Yeah, that's part of the initial impulse to put the exclamation point after martyr too. I mean, like, sincerely, just as a me looking person in America, I was terrified that, you know, there would be some clandestine Fox News report about like, ooh, like an Iranian born guy wrote this book about martyrdom, you know, whatever. I was like, ooh, should I be like careful the way that I talk about? And I and that just felt so silly to me because I'm making a piece of art. It's not like calling for, you know, I, I think it's just 
taking the question of dying seriously, sort of getting out in front of that impulse in myself to tiptoe around and to just put an exclamation point after it. Imagine them selling it in the Hudson News <laughs> with a big word with my very ethnic sounding <laughs> name underneath it. That like this is even a thought that you have to have when releasing your novel when so many authors are not having to think twice about yeah. the content they're writing about, what they're calling their books, what the cover looks like, that that's not even a thought in their mind. It's not a nerd. Again, like I'm dedicated to making art. This is what I want to do with my life. And I get to be a humble, grateful steward of this thing that has given my life everything, that has given my life texture and meaning at every turn. But I'd like to stay in the game for a minute too, you know. I also really want to talk about the dream sequences. There is also a line that mentions my mom. That I yeah, love. I thought about that. I thought yeah, about that. Yeah, when I was reading it, I was like, Mom! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't think about that. I loved that she showed up in conversation with Inspector Gadget. The great titans of the psychic life of someone who I'm, grew up in the 90s, right? Harris builds these elaborate dream sequences that put characters in conversations with real and fictional cultural imprints from like his father and Rumi, which is one of my favorite ones. Then you have Lisa Simpson. Can you tell me more about how you built those scenes? Like, is that something that you actively do or, or something you sort of imagined and dreamt up for Cyrus? I was a really bad sleeper growing up like Cyrus, and it really is a game that I would play just to, you know, we didn't have internet. My dad really did work on poultry farms and had to wake up really early. I just had to be really, really quiet pretty early in the night, and I couldn't sleep, so I just lay there for hours having to entertain myself with my own brain. And so this was a this was a game. These hundreds and thousands of hours of boredom where I would just be like, I wonder what Inspector Gadget would say to Cindy Crawford. And then I would just like script them in my head. And then like, just as in the book, one time out of every five or something, I would actually start to fall asleep. And then my brain would just kind of slowly take over. You know, when you're in that kind of gummy middle state, suddenly my brain would take over. And it was just like, I could grip my own dreams, sort of. I'd be like, who do I want to hang out with tonight? I did something similar because I also also have always had such a hard time sleeping um, really? but I was always one of the characters in my dreams and like maybe that sure. says something about me but I was yeah. like I am a character and then there's the other character. <laughs> I love though that yours you're just like watching I think that's a really beautiful sentiment to like sort of the way that you dream would you cast the characters too would you be like I'm gonna talk I would. to I had full relationships that happened in my mind and not at all in real life so sure. it's fascinating like reading a version of that where you're not really participating as one of the main characters of the dream. I mean, I, I certainly have those two, but for the purposes of the literary device in the book, just having the two talk to each other was just cleaner than suddenly having Cyrus appear. And, you know, although that's interesting in, in Martyr 2, Double Martyred or whatever, maybe I'll can, yeah. uh, consider that. <laughs> you often heavily reference or directly quote lyrics from songs mm -hmm. by variety of artists of Montreal, Sonic Youth, Emmylou Harris. Can you expand on how the music you listen to impacts your writing or how your writing impacts the way you listen to music? Originally, when I decided that I was going to be a poet, I thought that I would write about music as my day job and then just moonlight as a poet. Just pay the bills writing about music when I would read Jessica Hopper or Lester Bangs or, um, you know, the real titans of music writing. I would just be like, I'm never going to be that good. Maybe this is just my hubris or arrogance or naivete or some combination thereof. But I would read poetry and I'd be like, if I work really hard for the rest of my life, I'll be able to make something like that, you know, or I'll be able to make something that could make someone else feel the way that I feel when I read. I have an IV drip of music going at any, at every moment, like just constantly. As much as literature and film have inflected the topography of my psychic life, so has music, right? And I wanted that to be a big part of the book. It gives it the texture of live life. I mean, how many songs do we hear a day, even if just passively, even just like on the radio or, you know, on the subway, we hear probably a couple dozen at least, even on a yeah. fairly mild day songs or like in ads on the or on Instagram videos or whatever, right? And so I wanted to give it that texture of lived reality too. I've made a playlist of like every song mentioned in the book and it kind of it kind of feels like a little mixed day, like not super intentional. And there's like some classical yeah. stuff too because there'll be like a, you know, lots of like Rocky or contemporary R&B and stuff like that. And then like a 15 minute classical interlude, which is kind yeah. of fun on a mixtape too. Drop the mixtape when the book comes out, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will, I will. You included a quote by Teresa Spector in the hard copy, brilliantly captures the tone of Martyr, which is dark and light all at once. My God, I just remembered that we die. I'm curious what made you choose that quote in particular. Exactly what you said. It, it feels 
completely harmonious with the rest of the book in a way, right? Like it feels sort of funny in a way, um, but also literally deadly serious. We do walk around our entire lives largely forgetting that at some point we just stop and no one can tell us what happens on the other side of it. And the fact that we ever talk about anything else is kind of a testament to our ability yeah. to cope. The vast majority of eternity is spent not being Papa and Kaya. You know what I mean? Whether we're nothing or something, it's not this. The fact that we ever talk about anything else is is insane, right? Lending materiality to the texture of time, I think, is one of the things that this book is interested in. And, and that quote gets at it so well and then it continues but for now it's strawberry season which reminds me of this russian myth that tolstoy talks about i believe um a guy is being chased by a monster and he's running and he jumps into a well and at the bottom of the well he realizes there's a dragon and so he grabs onto a branch but then mice are eating the branch mm -hmm. but then he sees that there's honey trickling from the edge of the branch and it's like he knows that his doom is impending mm -hmm. and yet he goes to lick the honey and yeah. i feel like that is how we as humans live we're allowing that beautiful distraction otherwise all day we'd sit there saying my god i just remembered that we died yeah uh, perfect the people in my life who seem to me most sort of enlightened like evolved furthest along down the line are those people who are fully aware of the fact of our dying are fully aware of the fact of our mortality and thus are able to experience the honey that much more fully yes. you know what i'm saying i always ask us this question but I know it's very loaded do you have a book you'd recommend to the book club or a book that you've gifted to people the most because that's maybe a little bit easier oh yeah yeah there's a book by this writer named Rachel Kong called Real Americans I just read it and it's so elegant and strange in the first hundred pages you think it's going to be one thing and then it completely changes in delicious strange way and each of the books that it is is so good at being the kind of book that it is it's one of the most propulsive entertaining readable text that I've read in a long time and I just read it and so I'm really excited about it it's a good year for literature I'm saying I'm saying yeah <laughs> it's like I'm 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 trying to catch up I've been so again like nose pressed to the mural with this thing yeah. but now I'm seeing all these other books coming out around mine and I'm like oh I gotta read this one I gotta read this one you know and that's why I do not finish a book that I am not in love yeah. with 100 percent there's the opportunity cost. Yeah, the opportunity yeah. cost is immobilizing. I could keep yeah. you all day, but I know that you're like running around and in between flights. I do actually have to get on a flight here in like 20 minutes. Get on, yeah, get on your flight. Thank you so much for doing yeah, this. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaya. This was incredible. And shall in the fullness of time, our paths will bend across. I would love that. Thank you so much.